Tim, go ahead and plug us in. So we are live, live stream. Um, so just don't forget that these go up <laughs> close to the mouth. Um, okay, great. Well, uh, welcome to Trace Extractions. Uh, my name is uh, Sean Barnes. I'm the gallery coordinator at the Leonore R. Fuller Gallery in the Kenneth J. Menart Center for the Arts at SPSCC. And um, before I begin, uh, I have a couple of acknowledgments that I'd like to, like to announce. Um, South Puget Sound Community College uh, is located on the ancestral lands of the Stachos Band of the Squaxin Island Tribe and the Nisqually Indian Tribe, who have long been stewards of the region's waters, plants, and animals. The southernmost point of the Salish Sea, these lands were and still are a place of gathering, trade, and community for many Coast Salish peoples. We recognize that all who are not Salish peoples are visitors here, and we commit to join these people to share their history, build relationships, increase res representation, and restore the living world around us. I'd also like to give special thanks um, to those that support the arts here at SPSCC, including the Leonore R. Fuller Gallery Committee, um, the SPSCC Foundation and Board of Trustees, and all of our generous donors and sponsors and patrons, and especially the artists whose traditions and explorations vitalize and enrich our lives. Right? <laughs> um, so we're gathered here to visit with artists Stephanie Bird, Stephanie Serpic, and Victoria Smits. Um, each artist presents a unique approach to reconciling uh, shared experiences through modern technology and traditional materials. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce you all here just real quick, just a little, I kind of edited down from your bios and statements. So oh, if it's not correct, we can add it something on there. Um, so uh, to my left, uh, is Stephanie Bird. Um, and Stephanie trained with the uh, Abramovich method of performance with Marina Abramovich. I'd love to hear stories if you have any. Um, Stephanie is also the recipient of multiple grants and support for their work, which has been reviewed and featured in notable uh, publications such as the Public Art Review Magazine, the Public Art Archive, the Huffington Post, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, New Media Caucus, and Art Papers Magazine. Bird received a BFA degree in photography from Georgia State University and holds a master's degree in visual art from the University of California, San Diego. Bird is currently assistant professor of experimental media in the film studies department at the University of North Carolina, Carolina William Ting, Wilming, Wilmington. Force that out. Uh, Bird is also the founding director of the Intersectional Feminist Media Lab embedded in the University of North Carolina, Wilmington's Film Studies Department. Welcome, Stephanie. Stephanie Serkit, Serpic uh, is a painter whose work explores themes of isolation, grief, and healing. Her work has been shown in various exhibitions in the U.S. and internationally, and she is a fellow at several residencies, most notably at Mass MoCA in North Adams, Massachusetts, the Florence Trust Studios in London, and the Vermont Studio Center, where she was awarded a full fellowship and stipend. Resident, uh, recent exhibitions include a solo show at the College of Southern Nevada and a two-person exhibition at the Munson Williams Proctor Arts Institute at the Museum of Art at Pratt in Utica, New York. Okay, I'm not familiar with all that East Coast <laughs> verbiage. Um, <laughs> with all due respect to Utica, New York. Um, <laughs> she was awarded uh, a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant in 2020, and in 2018, she received the Ruth and Harold uh, Shenvin Foundation grant. Stephanie received a BFA from Carnegie Mellon University and an MFA from the University of Chicago. She currently lives and works in Brooklyn still. We need to update that. At least I've moved. <laughs> yes. Sorry, yes, I, I just moved a few months ago, upstate New York. Well, just outside of the city. Nice. Um, and uh, last, certainly not least, Victoria Smits. Um, Victoria is an interdisciplinary artist living in Eugene, Oregon. She holds a BA in English, Art, and Secondary Education from Calvin College, and an MA in English Education from the University of Buffalo with a concentration in creative writing. And so I'm really interested to hear how, how here now. Um, uh, Victoria has exhibited nationally and internationally, most recently at uh, Spilt Milk Gallery in Edinburgh, Scotland, 
uh, Intersect Arts Center in St. Louis, Stay Home Gallery in Paris, Tennessee, the College Art Association uh, Conference, and Yellowstone Art Museum. Her art and writing have been published in Homeworks, Torpor House, and Literary, Literary Life Chapbook. She completed a residency through the School of Visual Arts during the pandemic and received a mini grant from Integrity Arts and Culture Association for her documentation of labor made visible via GPS tracking systems. And Victoria will be graduating with an MFA in studio at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Cool, well, early congratulations in 2023, right? Yeah. Yes, so that's coming, awesome. Okay, great, um, get rid of this top page with one hand. Um, so uh, the way that um, I like to operate these talks is to kick things off with questions. Um, and often the, these artist talks kind of take on a life of their own because we're artists and a lot of times we like to talk about our work, um, talk about our, our creations. Um, so this first question, and of course I've shared all these questions with you guys, um, but uh, I know, I know I'm, I'm curious, and I know a lot of the folks that are here and the folks that have come into the, the gallery have been curious, like, so why have each of you chosen to use the materials you have to communicate these personal experiences of confinement uh, during the lockdown phase of the pandemic? Why, why working with these particular materials? And I'm just gonna leave this open to whoever wants to jump in. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to start by saying you guys probably have a more interesting answer <laughs> than I do <laughs> because I'm, I work in traditional media. I work in uh, oil paint, um, and I've always been a painter, so it, it was sort of like just natural for me to continue my practice with this these materials. Um, the only, you know, wasn't new for uh, the pandemic, but or but, you know, fairly recently with these paintings are... Um, a process I've used where I sand the surfaces of the paintings, which you know wasn't something I've done in the past, um, and it was you know to uh, push forward the you know what I wanted to with the subject matter, um, but I I still work very traditionally. I think you know you guys probably have more much more to say since you know you use different different technologies. I have a question to to add on to that. So um, is there something about oil paint that, because you could have continued painting other things through the pandemic, but these also have, um, there's a lot of emotional content. And so, and you also work in other media. <laughs> I do. <laughs> is there something about oil that resonated with you? Well, what I, you were experiencing? Um, I'm, I'm more, I'm certainly more comfortable with oil since that is the media that I've been working with. Um, and I know you're alluding to some watercolors that I did during the pandemic, which you know I didn't I mean, include in this show, um, partially because that's still a media that's new to me and I feel like I'm still learning. Um, but oil paint, you know, I, I think my, the facility that I do have with it allowed me to convey what I wanted to convey, you know, the emotion and the, the, you know, as you talked about, the themes that I work that I work on with my work, because I'm comfortable with it, and I, you know, felt like I could manipulate the paint in a way that I wanted to. Um, so it was sort of natural for me to to continue with oil paint that way. I can I'll pick up from there. Uh, well, for me, this body of work is a departure in that I my original training was as a photographer, but since that time. Uh, I've worked mostly in public art that's a mixture of performance, projected media, video installation, interactive media spaces, and it, it was a bit of, of a surprise for myself to move back into the world of photography. And during the pandemic that I had, um, so it's a little bit of the backstory of sort of where I was in my life that led to this, that I had recently taken a job in Arkansas. I interviewed for the job on the internet and I never gone. I just said yes and I moved and I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything about the region. Yeah, I know, I had <laughs> nothing. And I arrived in August 
and then that March was when the world shut down, and so it was like it. I mean, it was this sort of extra layer of feeling isolated, and um, I was inside of my home that I really loved, and it felt like this wonderful that I had been in Southern California and I uh, was hearing stories of what my friends were going through and people that I was, you know, very closely connected with in Southern California. This very different reality that they were faced with versus where I found myself where it was more rural and it was it, there was more sort of nature and freedom to move about but yet inside of this house and without a lot of community in that area and sort of learning how to navigate this new reality and I had been experimenting with some technologies it's a merger of something called photogrammetry and also lidar sensors and so the, the sort of short story of that is photogrammetry is a way to take two-dimensional images and then to mesh them together to make a three-dimensional form. With LiDAR, um, it is a type of sensor that sends out a laser pulse when it makes contact with a, a solid surface. The beam is bounced back to the device and it makes little, like that image on the far end there, that they're called point clouds. And so it's a way to make, a just by individual little dots or pink, like a, almost, I was thinking about this as like this sort of new media reference to pointillism of like these individual little dots are actually referencing a three-dimensional space. So that's, that's actually the scan of my entire house, which, you know, that yeah, was this one on the screen where too. I was the <laughs> entire time. <laughs> um, so I was really fascinated in these artifacts from the capture process and uh, like the image in the center there, you know, like the, the little square one. Mm -hmm. Those are actually the artifacts of the photogrammetric capture process. That's sort of the when the, the mesh and the models are being created, that's a, a file that really you never see, but I actually thought that was one of the most beautiful components of it, is just these little moments of abstraction. And if you look closely, you can actually see little moments from inside of my house of a, a bedspread or a bookcase, or, but it's just sort of hidden in these little, uh, little collages um, that are artifacts of the capture process. So uh, it was an exploration into form and thinking about this form in a space in a new way, particularly with this technology and using it in a way that it's not designed to be used to see what I could discover through that process and sort of what um, I could discover about my space that in a, in a way of looking at it differently of, um, of complicating my relationship to that space with the technology. Uh, my work, I think, came out of both a feeling and a desire to capture a little bit of an opposite feeling. Um, I, my work is GPS tracking of invisible labor. And when I start, started the whole process, I didn't have really any idea of what the material would be that I wanted to use. I just knew what, how I felt. And so, for me, during the pandemic, we closed down during, um, on March 18 um, in Oregon, where I live. My partner is an emergency medicine physician, and so his protocols immediately changed significantly. And then my youngest was in third grade, and so he came home from school. And for me in my art practice, the um, time I'm home, <coughs> the time that he's at school especially, is when I make my art. And so immediately I didn't have any time for myself to do that, pro have that process. And my partner was in this crazy situation of every day not knowing and finding out a little bit more. Uh, and it was, it was very stressful. And then we also ironically had two of our older students, our older kids who were graduating from college. And they up graduating in our, in our living room, which was a hard thing for them. So in contrast to this normal freedom I had, I was suddenly confined in my home, um, similar to what you uh, talked about, Stephanie. And for me, the thing that regulates sort of my nervous system is walking and running. And I remember sitting in my kitchen one moment and feeling so stressed out and thought, I'm going to just track this invisible labor and um, see what happens. And I collected eventually about 10 of those and was thinking also about this concept of that felt congested, felt intense, felt dark of light and uh, um, reflection and uh, the imprint that the record would leave. And so I was really intrigued by that concept and thought uh, acrylic seemed like an interesting thing to potentially etch. I didn't know a lot about how I would do that process. Uh, the GPS is uh, 
<coughs> recorded in keyhole markup language, um, which is a basically a set satellite to use is sort of Google Earth. It's like the first language that was used to create Google Earth. And so I figured out through a lot of research how to translate that and um, thought acrylic would be great. Um, but at the same time, my first instinct was clear acrylic. Uh, it was very still early in the pandemic. Didn't think about sourcing that out very much. And of course, that was not available because every single place that needed any kind of uh, protection had clear acrylic. And so I happened upon the blue violet, which ended up being, I think, a much better result for me and um, figured out how to transfer all of it into Adobe Illustrator. Uh, there's, I used a geo converter to, to convert it from the KML format to a PDF and then moved it into Illustrator to have those etched. And so I really, as I said before, love the idea of the lightness that they, that, that they sort of suggest and how the lightness, again, was in opposition to the feeling. But at the same time, the, the, the records have that intensity, that frenetic kind of energy that I felt that I couldn't get out of the space. So. Can I ask a question yeah. for Victoria? Absolutely. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> okay. Let's let's talk. Yeah. Let's let's okay, have, let's just talk it out. When you, when you um, thought about putting it on the acrylic, or, and, and or when it, you knew that it was going to be a clear acrylic, yeah. did you think about or take into account sort of the fact that you can see it on the wall too? I mean that it's sort of this shadowed image, or how does that fit into it? Yeah, I think it was a very organic process. So I didn't. I experimented with a lot of different acrylics. You know, once I knew I couldn't use clear, clear, I there was this blue violet which was close enough. And then I also played around with um, a translucent, it's almost like a milky acrylic and a couple others. Uh, I, I just experimented, we tried different, um, I worked with someone who has a very large laser printer and we just tried different uh, materials to see which one had a certain result. And then when, when we tried this particular one, it was like that aha moment where you're like, oh yes, this is it. And you, we held it up and it was like, you know, we put it near a wall and you could see that shadow. And so then even more metaphor started to happen with, yes, there's, there's this trace in addition to the etching that's behind it that occurs with the shadow. So, Yeah, I think the, I mean, that word trace and, you know, I, I put it into the title of the show and we, we kind of talked about that loosely on over Zoom a year or so ago. <laughs> um, but uh, but I think all all three of you, um, your your work approaches trace in in very unique ways, um, and so uh, there there's the material, but there's also this this content and thinking about and you kind of touched on. I'm going to start with you, um, but you kind of touched on on um, you know just that relationship to the space, and so. I'm wondering if you all could talk about, um, maybe talk about the content um, as it relates to like reproducing that experience, um, either through, maybe I should go to my questions and, um, but yeah, like uh, reproduction and, and the ritual act of making art sometimes will straddle the personal and the political and um, especially in art culture. And I'm kind of thinking a bit about uh, you know, labor, and there's a history in, in, in art, especially um, addressing women's labor from embroidery and, and quilting to painting and where these industries have resided in, in history. But um, so I guess like, what was that ritual for you all to, you know, either with content, like thinking about windows, bed sheets, the actual physical labor, and then being in that space, and how that, if that, if that makes sense. These are broad questions. Um, I guess I can start. Yeah. That, for me, so I was also thinking about, going back to this, of, of feeling isolated and a lack of community and sort of being in this space, and, um, and, and we always, I, I would always say, you know, long days, and I would just want to get home. I just want to be home. I'd want to get back to my little bubble, and I am a homebody, and so that's, you know, that's my happy place. But all of a sudden, it started to feel con very confining, 
and I found myself paying attention to my space in a way that I never had before. And uh, those experiments with the technology, it's, you know, I'm always just curious about new tech toys and what comes out, you know, what new thing is there and how can I use it or how can I break it and do something that it's not really meant to do and just sort of see what comes from that. And also that I wanted to be able to, it was this strange relationship of like, I had to keep people away from my house, but yet this desire for like community and sharing space and, and thinking about a way to capture this and archive it and also make it public. There's actually, the scans that I made from the project are actually online, so you can actually take like a, this fractured, glitched tour of my uh, former home. I don't think we have that link. I'd no, love to put it on no. our webpage <laughs> if, if, you, if you're willing to share it, we'd yeah, love to. I, it's out there, I mean, we could talk. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there is a video, so I, there is a video piece that's on the website that you can kind of go along with that tour and sort of yeah, the domicile. Move, and like move through the walls. And what's interesting about that technology is sort of you can like fly through the wall and move through it. And I love like the, even some of those images you can see where it sort of falls apart and it's not this perfect replication of these spaces. And um, th th there's something very nostalgic about these pieces to me now that I'm not, I'm no longer in that space, I'm not in that particular moment in my life, but I've, I'm somewhere else now and it, it is this strange sort of abstracted archive of that time and this particular place that was really um, precious to me. Um, there it is. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> There's even one that's like the true, like the scan that's online you can kind of fly around my old house. Yeah, I think that, I mean, especially playing around with, um, oh God, there's just so many layers to this because there's there's this fragmentation, right? And that separate, like all of a sudden we're like being just pulled out of society. No, you must, you know, even if you are already a homebody, it's like now you have to be a yeah. homebody. Right. And that, that takes away a lot of agency and yeah. we all kind of felt that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then this technology is so glitchy and um, so how does that, I mean. And, and it's also too, it's like your most private personal place and you put it online for strangers and that was a part of it for me too, of like if I'm gonna do this, I have to be okay with like putting this out into the world. But I did like clean my house. <laughs> like there's, there's I, I just wanted to be as honest as I could but at the same point I was like, no, I have to do the dishes, I can't. Like yeah. it can't be too, you know, I've gotta like clean just a little, so yeah. <laughs> I think that's funny because I'm using beds that aren't mine. Yeah. I mean, this is, oh, and windows. None of these are, I just, well, so I'd, where, I'd have to think about it. Where do they come, where the images come they, from? They come from a lot of different places. Um, some some of them are photographs my husband has taken. Some A lot of them are found images um, online, various sources. They kind of come from all over the place. Some, you know, I have taken or people have given me. Mm -hmm. um, people will send me images of beds. Um, that they've taken in hotels or something. Um, so they're, you know, it's a very personal, I mean, speaking of personal space, and the windows too. I mean, there are these very sort of personal interior spaces, the beds and the windows, um, but none of them are, are specifically mine. But I, I wanted this idea of sort of this universal experience mm -hmm. that, you know, these could be anybody's beds. These, mm -hmm. you know, are all of our beds and windows and, you know, this in trying to, you know, convey the idea of, of grieving and healing, you know, this is a shared experience mm -hmm. in that way. So the idea that they're not personal was sort of part of kind of what I was trying to get across. I think labor is a big part of my, my project. And I, you know, there's so much research out there about invisible labor um, in the home. Uh, typically, a lot of the research is for cisgender heterosexual relationships. And uh, I think the first, I think that it was Arlie, um, I can't remember her name, but sort of coined the phrase in, invisible labor back in the mid 80s. And then soon after that, there was a sociologist out of Berkeley who wrote a book called The Second Shift. And that was when it became a much more pronounced, more known kind of idea. And uh, there's just so much research about even still today, the inequality with in, in visible labor, um, and I think during the pandemic, four to five women, uh, or women four to five times were more likely to sort of 
quit their job, go home to take care of child care um, in the home and have to, and that has changed the unemployment rate for women. I think it's now back in double digits, which it hasn't been that case since 1948. So a huge shift in how women have been affected. Um, in the home, women are twice as more, uh, they do twice as much work um, of invisible labor, two more hours every day. Um, and again, that's in the cisgender heterosexual relationship. What's interesting in same-sex marriages is that isn't the case. So there's this hegemonic kind of system that has left this imprint. And so during the pandemic, um, that knowledge that I had about that, that kind of story, that those kinds of um, facts about women in the home, and then how much more they were impacted because of the pandemic, um, you know, was very present in my mind. Um, when I was doing those particular acts, putting laundry away, doing the vacuuming or whatever. And also the inability to have access to something else. I could not leave my home because my son was home at school. And um, I just had one and I thought about two. There, there were people who had multiple um, children at home, didn't have access to internet. I had a lot of privilege around that. Um, he had access to a computer. And so a lot of the idea of labor was very present in my mind when I was um, making you know, the, the records and also thinking about, like I said before, how I wanted the, the, the information to become visible. I wanted to be able to say, here, it, it is not invisible labor. It is, I, ca I, I can show you. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that was sort of the idea behind um, the initial, initial moment where I'm like, I'm going to track this. So, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, absolutely. And it, you know, it brings to mind um, the, the work of Meryl Ukelis, um, 1970s, early 70s, uh, performance artist, and had a child and then found herself doing everything and, and had, had to put grad school on hold, I think is her story, and um, then all of that labor, which was invisible, right? It was all in her house and it was diapers and dishes and laundry and everything. And so then she takes it out into the street cleaning the streets of New York City. Mm -hmm. And there's some parallels there, I think, yeah. to like just revealing this and calling attention to labor. And then just for you all, if you don't know O'Kaley's okay, work, um, it, it expanded into public works. Mm -hmm. And um, she ended up going on and doing a lot of, you know, which is really kind of um, would almost be like early stage of like, um, you know, social justice and social practice in art, I guess. Uh, maybe I should write a paper on that. But anyway. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I think um, it's, there's a, there is a lot of art that has been done a, around um, invisible labor. Um, I, I do think, though, it's, it's something that gets lost on a lot of people. I, I think we don't realize how much um, even people who are not mothers are doing invisible labor on any given day. When you search um, on your Google, you're providing information to the powers that be about what algorithm they're going to create to show what ad they want to give you, and that, that's labor. You're providing a service for them without even thinking about it. And so it can be very nuanced, that idea of labor, and how much we, we do that on any given day is, is immense. So, so I... Uh, start this off with with you and, and Stephanie but what is the relationship between um, you know picking a technology that has all these layers of mediations and steps removed from a very you know kind of a very personal emotional connection to a space and then the labors I mean these just looking at Victoria's image here um, this is the trace of, you know, dirty, methodic, um, uh, very, you know, labored mm -hmm. activity. What, what's this relationship with that technology? And maybe we've already kind of talked about it, but um, just to have that removal from it and to use this to express that rather than 
going directly at it, if that makes sense. I think for me, I, um, I mean, that, I, I don't, like I said before, the, the process wasn't, a, I didn't have foresight about how I was going to make it all happen. It was just the end moment in my kitchen where I started the process. But in hindsight, I look back and I think um, that there's, there's a lot of power systems at play that happen because of invisible labor. And I love the idea of using technology, um, which is often, um, you know, something that I, I think um, is it ha has an aspect of power to it. You know, it can be used for good, but can, it's also often used for not good. <laughs> and so there's something beautiful to me that I'm using this resource that um, I'm, I'm taking the power of that resource and using it for something that historically has been for a, you know an oppressed or disadvantaged or um, you know demographic, if you will. And 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 there's so many barriers for women in technology, right. coding and just <laughs> right. I mean, so I set you up. <laughs> Do you want to talk about tech bro culture? <laughs> I don't know enough about it to go deep into it, but I yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's so big. I yeah, that's so big. Um, I, I'll make a comment, and then actually, I have kind of a question segue sure. about what you're doing. Um, I, some things that I advocate for in my practice and my teaching and any any work that I do around technology or talking about technology is getting away from this, it's so hard, you know, you have to be this very highly skilled, special, elite human being to be able to do this work, that that's a myth, that that's a myth to try to convince people, typically minorities and women, that you don't have a place in the room, of like trying to make people feel like they, they that they, it's not okay to not know and be in that exploratory testing, let me just see how this works, mindset, which is so critical because it's really not, it's about being tenacious and being curious and not giving up. And that's really what it is. It's just deciding that you're gonna do a thing and sticking with it. And I always tell my students, like, just keep poking at it. Like, just keep working on it and you will figure it out. And I, I, I really resist this, you know, elite of like, oh, we have to have these big sort of grandiose expectations and explanations around technology that I, I really love accessibility of technology. And that's something that I, of these particular tools that I'm excited about is because it used to be something that was very expensive uh, and because of that cost associated with it, it was, you know, it was kind of hard to get a hold of it. And now because of smartphone technology, tablet technology, that it's becoming something that everyday people can access. And, you know, I like using the tools in a way that they're not designed to be used to just see, you know, these curious little experiments and what happens. but at the same time that there's very practical usages of these tools and it's gonna be something that more people have access to. In this future where we're not just thinking of images as flat two-dimensional X, Y axis image capture, but we're thinking about space and recording spaces also in an X, Y, Z axis, so thinking about depth in this future of media not being sort of flat rectangles, but it's actually like a physical space that we can co-inhabit, cohabit together in the virtual setting, and that, that's coming. I mean, we see little uh, hints of that, but it's gonna become even more mainstream stuff, so I, that's my soapbox. <laughs> so my question for you, actually, um, that I was, or a comment, I guess, is for, I, I was really touched by this work that it has, that it's so minimal and it's so abstracted, uh, and it, it's, it's simple, it's poetic, but what you're talking about is like there's so much richness to that of like the politics of, of gender and labor and also uh, of like, I got this reference to like um, um, mm -mm -mm, quantified life and like this, we're in this time of like we're recording everything about ourselves and like there's an app for everything of like what did you eat today, you know, what, how did you sleep and like everything that we're quantifying and I just really appreciate that thinking about this in a way of like quantifying labor and movement through space, but yet for this very, um, you know, the feminist uh, take on labor. So I just really appreciate that. Thank you. Can I just comment? I think, um, you know, listening to, to both of you talk about your work and thinking about the technology involved, and I feel like my, you know, I, I work, you know, hand on, you know, it, it is, 
I'm, I'm working directly and you guys have these um, processes and technology and you have to, you know, this transfers to this, transfers to this, printed that way, you know, you know both of you, and yet it still comes across as being very intimate and personal. I mean, there's something, um, you know, kind of fascinating about that, that like, despite all of the technology and processes that you both have to go through, and, and I'm, you know, I've been sitting here looking at, at these two and, you know, and, and thinking about these personal spaces that like, it still feels personal. It still feels, you know, really, you know, it's a part of yourself despite the levels to get to this, which is kind of fascinating. So let's talk about that, bec about just because you, you have, you're also mediating that experience. Mm -hmm. Like what you're sort like you already pointed out that these are not, it's not your bed. Right. It's not your window. Um, but as a viewer, um, we kind of have that experience of like, oh, we're looking at the artist's bedroom, right? This is Stephanie Serpik's experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so maybe you guys could talk about that process, like the step-by-step -step of how one of these things are made, or, I mean, you kind of hinted a little bit about it, um, Victoria and Stephanie, but like, where does, where does one of these pieces begin? Where does it, like, you pick up the thing mm -hmm. and, you know, and you start with you, yeah. Stephanie, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mine, it, mine is, in, in some ways, it's really simple because it is so direct. It, um, you know, I, I, the, the st I started the beds a few years ago and it I had a, literally like an image in my head of the, the, these paintings. I mean, it was almost as simple as that. And, and it was, um, and I wanted to create a series of them. It was not, you know, it, it not enough to just make one painting, um, partially to represent these different kinds of beds representing different people and different people's experiences. Um, but it, so it came from this, you know, idea and then, you know, finding the materials and, you know, make, making a painting, kind of like searching my way through a painting in the way that we all search through our work to create, a th you know, making it look like how I imagined in my head and had the feeling that I wanted to project. And then the windows too, I mean, I, you, you know, we talked about, I, I started, looking at windows out these out our windows during the pandemic and watching the world outside and you know feeling confined in our in my space and sort of the the window being the barrier between the inside and the outside and the same thing i mean how to put this feeling onto panel in my case you know through paint um, but i mean it was it's it is it's a very direct process it's just a matter of like you know sitting and working through it and um, the paintings don't always come easily physically. I mean, like a lot of people, there's always trial and error, and that was trial and error in this work, and it was sort of this searching process of creating these images that could convey the feeling that I wanted them to convey. I'm just curious about the process. So you, you, someone gives you a picture mm -hmm. with the sheets. I can't imagine they all arrive with a, with a negative space, <laughs> all, <laughs> all black. You know, so I'm curious about that, those decisions that you made to say, this is, this is the color palette I'm going to use or I'm going to sort of, you know, impose on this, these folds. This is what our, I'm going to crop the picture down or the image down, and this is what that I'm going to do with the negative space. And did you know right away, I'm going to make all of the negative space basically black or dark? Um, so I'm curious about that. Yes, um, is the short answer. Um, <laughs> the black space represented kind of the outside world and what is kind of going on around. I mean, the bed was um, sort of the, 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 the place to go to, to feel this feeling, whether it's grief or whatever it is. Um, and then the black was kind of like, as a way of like blocking out the rest of the world, all of the chaos outside. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mentioned also sort of that I sand the paintings. And so they're not just sort of completely flat black. There's um, not a literal texture, but you know, if you get close to them, you can sort of see um, there, there's a little sort of, they look a little rough, and that's a way of representing kind of the chaos in the outside. I didn't want the images to be these very clean, perfect, very precise paintings. I mean, the, the, there are some of them have drips, or some of them, you know, the sanding sort of represents the the labor mm -hmm. involved, yeah. the personal labor that you're going through, whatever this personal experience is. Mm -hmm. 
and, and yes, I mean, in terms of like the subject matter, the I'll the come across or somebody will give me whatever a, an image and then there is a process involved to figure out the right crop and right. you know kind of I'll block out parts of the image and kind of crop it and try it out and make adjustments and, you know so yes I mean that's that's part of the process mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. I kind of I have a question for you or I don't I, I don't know if it's a question let me just sort of work through my thought <laughs> it may just be a comment we'll see um, but when I so I'd seen the images of these works beforehand and then I, I arrived the other day and got to see them in person and they're just, they're so luscious, like they're luscious. And I I have this reference that I, wa I have actually my all time favorite art piece. There's a photograph by Imogene Cunningham mm -hmm. called The Unmade Bed. Mm -hmm. And it's my favorite piece of all time. Mm -hmm. But I think you may have her beat <laughs> in the way that you have rendered these beds. Because I've always, like that image to me, I, what I fell in love with of how tender it is, mm -hmm. of just like thinking about that space. And it's just mm -hmm. like the traces of the people that were in that space. But like the way that you've rendered this with paint, and it's so delicate, and they're so lovely, and that it's in silhouette. I mean, it's just, they're just absolutely lovely, lovely pieces. And um, yeah, I'd be curious about your experience with lockdown and how that changed your painting practice of if mm, if you yeah. felt like it was because i know for you know for some people it was like okay now i can just i can do the work that that was for some people <laughs> it was their experience of like right. okay now i can really like dig into my practice so i'd be curious of when you were making this this um body of work of like or, or when you were painting during the pandemic yeah. of how what that looked like for you and yeah uh, we talked about this with sean's class just last night um couldn't get to my studio or you know, was encouraged not to go to my studio, but to be out, mm. you know, with other people. And so I started making watercolors, mm. um, which, you know, as I explained to the class, I have never done before. I've, I've never used watercolors ever. It was a completely new experience. And, um, and just as a way in, I was using the same imagery. I was using the beds um, as a way to just something to kind of focus on. So my practice for a long time changed. I mean, I wasn't making the work that I was making. It was the same subject matter, but it was more about kind of learning this new material. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then when I finally could get back in my studio, however many months that was, um, you know, I, that's when I think I started to do the windows mm -hmm. because I'd spent all that time looking out the windows mm -hmm. and, you know, wanting to kind of bring that into the practice too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, you know, initially it was something else, you know, it's like, like doing different work entirely just because that was all I could do. I mean, like you talked about, yeah. you know, you're kind of taken out of the whole, and you, I mean, you did your own different thing and being in lockdown too. <laughs> I grew up in Southern Missouri, so I, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I talked to a lot of uh, local artists here during the pandemic um, that did not want to make, that, um, you know, for whatever reason, they they just didn't have the desire to, to make during during that time. So it's kind of the other the other side of the coin. And there's you know there's a there's a great deal of bravery I think um, for artists and you know specifically with you all during that time to to try to wrestle with these things and to move through art you know. Um, which art <clears throat> art can be therapeutic. It's cathartic. It can it can take us places and um, and help us to understand things. And I know as an artist myself, it's a lot of times I'll just thinking through making and feeling through these things. And um, and I think I think it's interesting in your work also. Um, just and I keep you know I'm facing uh, your painting, Stephanie, and that absence in the room. Um, and it, that, that negative space and that space around the windows and the, and the fabrics begin to have its own symbolic presence, right? And so it's, it's either absence or, or lack or even more symbolic of, mm -hmm. of loss yeah. and things. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really nice balance. Um, and then I think also this, this connection with the technology, because I agree with Stephanie, there's, there are emotive things coming through these very cold 
precise machines that, you know, I was, I was talking with a friend uh, the other day who was looking at this work and, you know, likened it to like the water pump on a vehicle. Like these things are never meant to be seen. They're never, their function is never meant to be recorded really in this way. But then um, to use that and to, to, to take that back in some way and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna express. Um, and I think, I think movement and, and then space and how we make home from space, those are, um, those are interesting ways to, to express how we feel. And paint, paint won't do that sometimes. Sometimes it will, but um, uh, anyway. I have a yeah, question. keep going. Actually, yeah, I, and I, I'm, I'm sure it's, oh, I think it's back over here. I had a, I had a question about this, of um, th these pieces in the back, Victoria, of like the participatory pieces and like crowdsourcing this. I, I just wondered where they were. I was really taken by those, and I just like to hear more about what's happening with those pieces. Uh, so I have, I, I started thinking about this is not my problem <laughs> or issue or, you know, thing that I'm dealing with alone. It's, it's pervasive. And so I thought, well, it would seem appropriate to make this visible not just for me, but for other people. And so long term, what I would like to do is have a bunch of participants also track their invisible labor. And so I'm just starting to collect those. I have a couple here um, where... I have created a website that you can go to and you can hit contribute and you put a statement about your own experience in caregiving. I connected it mostly to mothering because of how it relates to me and I use that in a very broad sense. Um, and But also that you're not just this identity of this caregiver, that, that you are something beyond that. And so when you go to contribute, you um, fill out a statement that talks a little bit about that experience, who you are, then there's another step where you go to an, the actual app that I use, and there's instructions for how to download the app, track some invisible labor, and then save it, and then um, those are up now on the website. So if you go to the website, it's called IamMotherIamMore.com, and you can see there's two people. One of them's here tonight. <laughs> um, my sister-in-law, who's a teacher, who I think um, teachers have their own story about the pandemic, of course. Uh, but the other one is an artist on the, west, on the East Coast. So, And then I have others that are in the works right now. They're, I just don't have them up on the website yet. So, But long term, I would like it to be an accumulation. We were talking the other day about how the work is exhibited, and I think it would be interesting to set them up, you know, I think of 40 of them in a row. You know, that accumulation of this invisible labor would be really interesting. So, Yeah, and even the structures uh, of how that set up the patterns and, you know, a single file line right. or or what have you yeah. or I was just at Disneyland this summer so <laughs> one of these kinds of lines it just kind of goes back and forth but um, yeah and so those are in the back of the gallery and so if, if you're watching online and you come in to visit um, find those there's a little card that has all the information about the project um, and then of course on your website and we have links to that on um, Victoria's page on, on our gallery website too, so so that's archived. Um, do you guys have anything else you want to talk about? I mean, we could we I'm sure we could keep talking about so much because um, we didn't even talk about like just how your work is in relation to other historical aspects of you know artists addressing you know thinking about like Van Gogh's room or you know Gentileschi in terms of you know confronting labor reserved for a specific gender and class but do you guys have anything else we're, we're right at seven o'clock so I just quickly like to know what everybody's working on now like what's next what's now no that's great um I recently got back from a uh, just a week long residency where I it was because it was only a week I actually didn't do a lot of I, I did no oil painting so I, um, I was telling Sean I did, I did a little bit of pulled out my watercolors and, and did a little bit of that but um, but almost more importantly I had some conversations and um, it's really made me think a lot about what happens with my work next mm -hmm. and you know I think I want to continue with some of the same subject matter but see 
other like changes that I can make and you know thinking about is that overlapping um, for example overlapping different beds or adding other maybe graphic elements as a way to kind of disrupt the surface a little bit to mm -hmm. sort of um, you know create a different emotion or kind of think about other ideas so I'm, I'm still processing um, but that's sort of where I am I just completed a body of work um, related to attachment theory, and I'm just very interested in that. As being a parent, I have four children in a blended family, and think a lot about what I have or have not done <laughs> to impact them. And so that includes a lot of different things, has some video, some sound, some sculpture, ceramics, um, textiles. Uh, and so that is sort of just winding down and then I want to extend that a little bit more. I'm very curious, there's some research about emotional inheritance and how we um, basically inherit through DNA molecule, molecules attached to our DNA, um, aspects of trauma and depending on experience that can be activated and so the science of that is really interesting to me. I'm with interesting to me, I'm, I'm just starting to look into that. So I don't know what that will mean for what I'm going to make, but um, and how also it relates to my own story, but also, you know, in a universal sense uh, for attachment theory, our attachment behavior system really affects how we engage other humans um, and, and how we engage in partnerships. So that's just really intriguing to me. So, but Stephanie, what are you I'll up to? <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, oh, I have to answer that too. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I tend to work on a couple things at once that there's, I'll say one that's in the early stage. We were talking about residencies, but I, I did a, um, a residency at um, the Hambidge Center, which is up in Raven Gap, Georgia, which is not too terribly far from where I'm from. I'm from the northwest corner of Georgia, but that's in the northeast corner. And I, growing up in Georgia, I would hear these stories of, of these, of, of like folk magic traditions of, uh, my mother would tell the story of when she was a young girl that her mother sent her to the woman down the road to like cure a wart on her hand about if you rub a coin on it and then throw it away and when you forget about it, it'll, it'll be healed. And, and I'd hear these sort of quirky stories and I was like, what is this? Like, where did this come from? Who are these people? Like, what are these traditions? And um, when I was at the Hambidge Center that it's right down the road from, um, the Foxfire magazines and books archives. I don't know if anybody grew up with that. Yeah, the Foxfire books. Love those. And so many great stories about, you know, Appalachian culture and uh, interviews with people that were folk healers and about these traditions and water dowsing of all these. And in their archives, they have these great interviews with water dowsers and photographs of the people that hold the sticks and they look for water. Absolutely fascinating. <laughs> so, um, because I'm a techie, I took my virtual reality camera and worked with like scanned images and sounds from the archives, and I'm, I think it's going to be a virtual reality film about Appalachian folk magic. We'll see what happens, but that's what I'm working on. I, I love that because you know, like I said, I grew up in southern Missouri, um, southeast Missouri, and spent most of my young life in the Ozarks mm -hmm. and my grandmother and you know grandparents um, and. I never got too deep into it, but um, you know, I'd hear these things mm -hmm. and and meet people that spoke completely different language. Um, we always called it hill speak, mm -hmm. but um, I do know that there's a huge difference across the Mississippi mm -hmm. between, mm -hmm. you know, Appalachia and the Ozarks, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of a lot of overlap too. Well, the Scott Irish friend. Anyway, yeah. we could talk for a while yeah. about that. Um, <laughs> So uh, let's, uh, shall we open it up to anyone else? Does anyone have any questions for the artists? Yeah. I'll let you pass this one around. <laughs> have a mic oh, yeah, okay. Um, so this is for Victoria. When you're doing your, um, you know, the GPS and everything, it looks pretty like geometric. Were you ever thinking in your mind as you were doing it, like, oh, if I walk this way, if I put this away first, <laughs> like this will make this other line and maybe like almost doing some art thing in your head as you're walking or was it just kind of like, I'm doing my thing, like whatever it's gonna be is how it's gonna be. 
Super interesting question. I actually didn't think about that. I'm thinking as you're talking, I'm like, maybe I should have. <laughs> they could have looked differently. Um, I was curious about the accuracy of GPS because it is designed to you know, be on mostly on roads, larger areas. Um, and I had talked at one point with a geographer at the University of Oregon and, uh, about potentially doing more nuanced work with it. Um, but you would have to set up these Bluetooth beacons throughout your home. I think if I went through that process, it probably would have been more like what you're describing, where I would have been maybe intentional about how I'm moving. Uh, I think I was so stressed out, <laughs> I didn't think about it. I just wanted, I was sort of like, I'm going to put this laundry away, you know, and just did it. So. Yeah, I didn't really think about, I don't even think I looked at the results until I had done, a, you know, several of them. And, you know, it was a very organic, you know, evolution from the beginning of the moment I was, you know, I was feeling what my feelings and it became something, so. As someone who is like at home with my three younger siblings helping them out all the time, that really affected what I was doing. But so like having a school age child, how did that affect like the process of your art, I guess? My studio is right off my kitchen um, right now. Uh, and so, and I work best by myself. That's just how I'm wired. And so uh, immediately, that not only did my youngest was did he come home from school and he was doing third grade at home in a system that really was not yet set up to be at home so no one knew what they were doing so it was always stressful like how do you turn in something into Google Classroom I don't know you know and there's that component and then uh, my two older children were graduating and one of them uh, wasn't sure about whether he was going to live in Southern California or, or in our home. And so for a while, he and his roommate were like, let's just stay here until we figure it out because no one knew how to figure out anything. So immediately, all these people were around all the time. So it was very challenging for me. Um, and I think in that way, this particular work was a, a, a good sort of movement away from some of the other, I don't think I could have done ceramics right in my studio with other people and their energy around. There was something about like, I don't even know what I'm doing, but I'm gonna figure this out. I just wanna figure out how to do it. That took that nervous energy and that curiosity and just you know channeled it into research and how to figure it all out. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but um when it comes to creation and motivation, like what is the ultimate motivator? Is it to present an idea? Is it to present, you know, uh, a feeling? Is it just, uh, or is it just kind of just organic and you have to put something out there? Um, you know, I, like in Victoria's case, um, this came out of the pandemic, I think. I don't know if you were thinking about the invisible labor, maybe you were, but it seems like that almost forced your hand in a sense of like, I don't have other ways to create at the moment, but now I do in a sense, and I'm gonna demonstrate what my day is now or, or something like that. So where does that motivation come from to create just whatever? That's for everybody, yes. For me, the motivation, I'll just jump in, I guess, really quickly. But uh, yeah, for me, the motivation, I, I was working with a mentor at the time um, because I had wanted to go to graduate school again and was trying to figure out what am I going to submit for my slide room portfolio. And uh, that mentor was Lenka Clayton, a uh, brilliant artist out of Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania. And I think she and I were just talking, and you know, she very much has encouraged encouraged me to just try things and and I think I'm just naturally curious as well so I th I think there was that meeting of the the moment of feeling and I need to I know about invisible labor and the research but I need to do something with this you know so. um. <laughs> 
Um, I think I'm just a maker, and I just mm. like to make things, you know, from even from when I was a kid. It was, you know, drawing or just whatever that form that took. It wasn't necessarily always about sort of expressing an emotion, or sometimes um, in the other work I've done previously that was more abstract, it was about colors, or it was, you know, I, you know, want to kind of explore bright colors or shapes, or, you know, I, I did some work that was pattern based, so it was, you know, just messing around with patterns and colors. Um, it's only sort of been more recently that it's, uh, or at least specific to this work anyway, you know, that it was about sort of expressing something in, in particular. But, it, you know, I, I think I've it's just about making things also. That's <laughs> such a big question. <laughs> why, why do you do what you do? <laughs> I, yeah, why? That question would have been really different. I, I, you would have got a different answer 10 years ago. I think, it, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. It's, I think that's, I think it's just part of my nature. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I do. I'm like that, I'm this, I'm that far down the road of my life as like doing the artist thing. So I guess I'll just keep doing that. It's like just sort of what momentum at this point in my life. But I'll say like there are different types of projects that some happen very quickly and organically and effortlessly. And then there are others that it is just, I've got to fight and claw for it, for it to come into being. Mm. And it is, like there's another project that I'm working on, I've been working on it for three years. It is the project that will not end. And there's so much research and so much labor that has gone into that piece. I will never recoup the amount of time <laughs> that I put into that work. Um, and that's okay because I, I think I, I really love, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert has a really great TED talk about creativity, mm -hmm. and I, I completely agree with what she says in this talk, that um, artists are a conduit, that sometimes, you know, whatever form of art making, or creativity even, it doesn't have to be, you know, something that hangs on a wall, it goes into our art galleries, that sometimes there's just things that want to exist in the world, and they'll knock mm -hmm. on your door, and are you listening, and are you going to, mm -hmm. you know, pick up the phone and answer and bring it into being, and um, she has this really great little snippet where she talks about Tom Waits and how a song fragment came to him as he was driving in LA traffic and he actually speaks to the song it's like can you not see that I'm driving right now <laughs> in LA traffic like can you come back I was in the studio four hours today like can you please come back like at the appropriate time when I can you know take care of you so I, I kind of think about it that way that there are some works that they, they want to come into being is are you going to show up? Are you going to put the time in the studio? Are you going to like commit to making it happen? Because it's not like you see them and they just sort of effortlessly. Thank you for your great installation. Effortlessly make it onto the wall, but there's so much time and energy and like admin and all these other things of like that. It's not even a part of like the magic in the studio moment. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but maybe. I, well, I think everybody's so different with you know, why they create, I th at, but I think there is that, um, that thing where it's just, you just have to do something. And I think, you know, giving that the time it needs and trusting it and not analyzing why it's there, but just going with it. I think it's, it's easy to put barriers between us and being creative because it's like, there's so many other things to do and why am I doing this? And you know, if we come to the commercial aspect of things, like, you know, is it going to sell? Does it matter? Who cares? Am I making it to make money? Am I making it because it has to come out? I, I think there's just so many elements to that that, you know, can get in our way with being creative. So it's very interesting to hear everybody's perspective on that. So this is for anyone. Um, how long and what did it take for you to appreciate the mediums and the tools you had at hand to really put your all into each piece? I know that you guys talked about COVID and isolation having an effect on your art. Has there ever been a time where you didn't put as much thought into a piece as you normally would like to? The question? How long and what did it take for you to appreciate the mediums and the tools that you had at hand to really put your all into each piece? For example, has there ever been a time where you didn't put as much thought into a piece as you normally would like to? I 
can jump in. This, for this particular artwork, I think it did take a while, um, and the pandemic, uh, I was curious about whether you had issues with supply chain with your, your oil paints, um, because I know that there were times I was ordering other materials and they just weren't available, or it would take a long time. Um, and so for these particular works, I think it was a very labored, um, maybe pun intended, um, process of trying to take that initial idea, figuring out what I wanted to do, finding access to the materials, finding someone who would work with me, you know, with a mask on, because at the time we weren't vaccinated yet, um, and so forth. So that, but there are other times where I think I encounter a material and I have a raw idea about something I might have, might try, and then as it's as you're working on it, it's like, oh, look at this, and you know, you you have this like point of discovery that's really beautiful and unintentional, and uh, and mm -hmm. and that either can take you to another direction or maybe you end there, but I think it depends on probably what particular project it is and the nature of the work. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I agree. You know, there's some, and, and I don't know if this answers your question exactly, but some work just comes really easily. You know, that um, kind of like what you said, like it's almost like it happens by itself. You know, it, um, it's a great thing. <laughs> but I mean, more often than not, you know, it's a lot, it, it just takes a long time, you know, to, to get to what you're trying to get to. Um, and I mean, in terms of the materials, uh, I, the only issue, uh, I mean, I, you know, referenced not being able to get to my studio, and so I didn't have access to, to the materials, I, I mean, to anything, you know, and I had to just order in Amazon or whatever, you know, to, to get new materials, and that was when I, you know, got all the watercolors and all the stuff I did. Um, and then when I went back to painting, I mean, it was, I have a, a specific company that I used to make my panels, and they were working on a delay, so that was, I mean, there was sort of a delay to get just some of the materials just to be able to do these. Um, but, you know, that, that's about it. Um, I would say for me that I, <laughs> I, my objective is not to master any of the tools that I work with. Like, my goal is to sort of, you know, again, use them incorrectly. So I don't, I don't want, I don't, I'm not aiming for accuracy. I'm, I'm aiming for a mess and see what kind of, interesting thing happens in the mess. But, you know, in, in video, uh, like, that's a jest, but, like, many years <laughs> of working and testing and, um, you know, coming from video world, it's a long, it's a long, hard grind, whatever medium that you're in. And it's just showing up and putting in the time in whatever that particular medium that you're working in um, and just to stick with it. And I think it's actually the question of, like, when did you did you make a work and you didn't put as much time or effort as you feel like you should have? That sometimes I feel like it's the opposite. That sometimes the magic happens when you're not overthinking and you're just sort of letting something happen and you're trusting your gut and your intuition and it's developing that taste and that intuition and knowing when to just stop the thinking process and sort of let it happen. So I think it's uh, resisting the thinking. Sometimes it, it's got its part to play, but like sometimes it's it's moving out of that way of working. Can I ask you with, with your, and, and you know, because you both use these, you know, al alternative types of media and technologies, um, I mean, as a painter, like, you can, it's easy to just say, okay, I'm going to stop now, or uh, often, more often than not, you know, you do too much, and you're like, oh, should have stopped, you know, <laughs> um, but with you guys, because there are these processes, you know, how does, what does that mean for you guys? Is there a point where you can overdo it, or, do you know what I mean? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I think it's similar. I think there are definitely times where, you know, you I, I can sit here, and I'm sure, Stephanie, you can too, where you're like, oh, I could try this with this particular, you know, I could try that. But then at some point, too, you wonder, okay, now I need to just pivot and do something different, entire, you know, entirely different than than this particular project. So I think it, it's similar, the, the nature of that, you know, feeling of like potentially going too far with something or stopping is very similar. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, I have that thing, I've heard painters talk about this, of like it's never done, I just have to, you have to just take it away from mm -hmm. me. I feel that same thing, of like yeah. I could, in any of those works, of like even you know, the very digital ones, mm -hmm. the new media projects or video installations, that if I have a piece, let's say, you know, it's five, six years old, and actually I'll say this, I had a work from 2000, 
six, one of the old, like the earliest sort of works that I still, you know, would put out in public. <laughs> and I, I reworked it completely. It was like a recorded interviews and I, I wanted to like sit with it again and to listen to it again and re and go through the editing process again because I don't, I, I, I don't feel like it's ever totally done. Again, if that work was shown again in five years, I'd probably do it again. I'd re-edit and it sound. <laughs> Uh, Helen Frankenthaler and Cecily Brown, both abstract expressionist painters. Um, Cecily, a little more figurative. Um, Cecily still painting. But they talk about that pushing artwork to the point that it can or will fail, right? Mm -hmm. And that taking materials and breaking them or using them inappropriately, and it may fail, right? And you may not have put the right kind of energy into it and, and then there's also once you show it to someone else, right? And that's one of the, that, that can be a really challenging thing for artists too, is like you've made this thing and you really like it and then you show it to somebody and they're like, what, what the hell are you thinking? You know, why'd you do that? It doesn't work. Um, and, uh, but I, I appreciate that, uh, you know, this idea of just pushing it to the point where it could fail because that, and David Bowie, right? He, what is it? He says, you know, you, I don't remember the quote, but it's like walking into the water. You know, you've got to go past a certain depth at the risk of falling under, mm -hmm. um, because that's where that's where it is, mm -hmm. right? That's where it is. So you have to keep doing these things. And like with your, you know, the bed and just continuing the bed. It's like there's obviously a lot there, and y like you said, it's like maybe there's something more. You know, and you can keep doing this, exploring. Great questions. Anybody else? Cool. Oh, there is. There's a question on the live stream. What it? What is it? So exciting. It was stressful and crazy and grueling, and you know, you were in New York, and you, yeah. you were saying how you were watching everything out the window, and it, yeah, it was just, um, it was, I don't know if I'm, I would say I managed it. Yeah. <laughs> I got through it, right? I think it was, I mean, probably like anybody, you know, I mean, um, I mean, I was happy to have, you know, create a little workspace in my apartment mm -hmm. to continue making my work, and that probably helped me <laughs> mentally. Um, since you know work fell apart, you know my other way, you know, employment that work fell apart, and um, you know it was I was relieved to have like something to focus on, like mm -hmm. something to you know, d direct my attention every day, and that probably helped to get me through it. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, I, for me, I feel like I am a hardcore introvert homebody. Like sort of a miracle you got me here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that I, I, you know, it, what was really hard was, was everyone around me mm -hmm. that I, I, you know, teach and all of a sudden it was, I, ugh, I remember my niece was actually visiting me and I was in the middle of teaching a class and one of my students gasped, I got an email and gasped like to the point where the whole class, you know, everybody turns around and looks at her and she reads the email that says, campuses close everybody out in the middle of class you know just like pandemonium and and just just chaos you know and that like to to see my students and such as, as an emotional space and 
and everybody sort of scatters, and then for two weeks, it's the, myself and all the other faculty of like, how the heck are we gonna like teach college online? And you know, and it's such a quick pivot that we were trying to make. But so that I think honestly, that was the hardest part of like to be there for my students who. Um, I mean, th they're just, th those were some of the best students I've ever worked with, the students I was there with in Arkansas. And, um, and you know, we got through it and they did some uh, amazing work. I was teaching a video installation class online on Zoom. <laughs> and somehow we had enough technology where they were able to like take projectors home and work from home and they just made some really, really incredible work. And, and I think for all of us, like this wonderful little community that we had on Zoom, that, that was something we all had this like little built-in support system. Um, and th that was a really beautiful moment, but um, yeah, I think that was the hardest. Like I, I, I thrive and you know, just let me be in my house and if I never had to leave, I'd be totally fine with that. I mean, occasionally, like I do want to venture out, but not much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. well, we, we had an awesome, uh, uh, I, I mean, this is not just because I work here and, and we're we're presenting here, but um, SPSEC was really supportive. My dean was very supportive of, of everything we were doing. And um, I leaned into the gallery um, and put the gallery online and continued to work with artists over Zoom and do interviews. And so that for me was was one of the ways I, I, I kept myself busy was just leaning more into to my work. But um, I taught drawing online, so. I, I feel you, you know, um, but, uh, and then I got outdoors a lot. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. part of the question, but I, I'm, I've always, you know, I'm from Southwest Alaska and Southern Missouri, so I've, I've got, I've got to have that fix. And the land changed a lot. Um, places that uh, just people weren't there, but the eagles were there and the seals were there and the birds were there and it was a weird thing to be outside at times because I, I don't know if you would call that probably in the city especially uh, you know there's no no cars on the road mm -hmm. was the weirdest thing but and I'm similar to Stephanie that I would I would be you know my best um, vacation is just, you know a staycation by myself in my house <laughs> which sounds terrible and, and sad but um, but then everyone was in the house and they weren't you know we were they were all together and that was what was hard is is um, I was trying to make in a way that was like, did not feel right um, because I like to make with no one around. And um, I think it, that's when I, you know, in the fall of 2020 is when I did my SBA residency. It was online, but it was just like, okay, at least then I'm talking to other artists and um, working, you know, had some kind of focus to channel that like inability to be by myself, um, so. Well, this is, um, as always, conversations get, you know, we get deep into things. And um, this was a really great conversation. And thank you so much for coming uh, all this way. Thank in you. In some cases. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was great. Thank you. Great. And uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's, uh, there's snacks over there and water if you all, if you all want some. And... Um, this, uh, this artist talk will be archived on our website. Um, just go into past exhibitions, um, past exhibition seasons, and you can find it. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>